Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Bench Warmer Sports Podcast. I'm Rafi, as always, joined by Davian and Theodore. Boys, a lot has happened in the last week. We'll get right into it. World Series wrapped up. The Texas Rangers beat the Arizona Diamondbacks. If you recall, our loyal viewers from the last podcast, we were watching Game 5 as it was going down. Now we know that the Rangers wound up winning that game. It was a slow game for the most part. The Rangers hadn't scored until scored and even got a hit until after our podcast closed. So that was certainly maybe something that aligned in the stars that we weren't allowed to react to anything at all. Fortunately, no William Castellanos bombs as well because the Phillies did not make it. Always a good time to rip on Philly. But before we get into your guys' thoughts and my thoughts on the World Series and MLB playoffs, we got to start this off as we always do. We got the full set. We got everyone on the podcast. Boys, how are you guys doing? I am doing incredible. I'm coming off of probably one of the most fun days of my life. You'll have to stick around if you want to hear about that when we talk about college football. But honestly, Life is good. That's all I got to say. I mean, I'll uh, I'll kind of second that. I mean, I we've kind of gotten a bit of a backstory about Theodore's, you know, past few weeks. Uh, can't say it's as exciting as his, but I did go up to Syracuse, got to watch some actual good, like, actual college football. Like, these teams were are actually could be in contention for, like, bowl games and stuff. So that was um, pretty exciting. Uh, the Syracuse Stadium, uh it's absolutely amazing. That dome is electric. The uh, dome. Indeed, yeah. Uh, it was the the. Um, I mean, the atmosphere is electric. It was Parents Weekend as well. Um, so the, up there, so absolutely awesome. Our hockey team here at Cornell is just at, insane. Uh, we're ranked. Our women's and men's hockey were ranked last week top ten in the nation. I mean, there's nothing more we can ask. We're gonna be playing Harvard next week, this week, so I'll definitely be recording that. It's gonna be a packed stadium, over 5,000 fans in our little barn of a stadium, I guess you could call it. Um, so de- definitely check out our TikTok there, Benchwarm underscore Sports. Uh, and yeah, Rafi, how have you been? You know, same old, same old. Very excited. We have. I've been working on a new segment for the podcast that'll be going up in a couple of days, featuring so. Very excited. Been working on that just before this podcast, and I'll wrap it up later on, finish up the editing work. So I'm very excited to see how that goes. Obviously, any day is a great day when I'm recording this podcast with you guys. It is a great way to take some time to talk about what's going on in the sports world, take a break from my constant realm of studying. But granted, that is what I chose, so I have no right to complain, and I enjoy it. School aside, before we get back into schools and colleges, MLB World Series, I touched on it earlier. I don't know how much of the playoffs you watched. Personally, I was a bit disappointed with how the World Series was covered because there was numerous days where I completely forgot that there was a game on that night. And I Mm -hmm. found out at like 8, 9 o'clock, oh, shoot, this game's on. Let me turn it on. It's the 6th, 7th inning. I don't know about you guys, but I was a bit disappointed with the overall lack of World Series hype and World Series coverage, especially throughout the World Series. But overall throughout the entire MLB playoffs. I felt like it wasn't really pushed upon people at all. 1,000% agree. Um, And look, this is always the problem when small market teams play. Um, First of all, I thought that it was, in theory, a battle of two teams that should have matched up really well against each other. We should have been in for a really competitive series, but at the end of the day, we weren't. And... I think a lot of people just were not. First of all, a lot of people just weren't into the series. And I understand why. I mean, it lacks a lot of the juice that it would have had had there been someone like Houston or Atlanta or the Phillies or the Dodgers in the series. Um, yeah. Beyond that, though, I think you are right because I have the same thing. I will say, thank God they like are having the teams play more. I don't know if you all remember how atrocious the 2022 World Series was when teams were taking days off in between home games. Yeah. Like, at least we're not doing that anymore, because that, that pisses me off. Um, if you want to take a day off between travel days, sure, whatever. I'm opposed to it personally. I think they should be playing seven straight days, because that's what baseball's about. But if you want to take a day off, I'm not going to fight it. You know, it's not the end of the world. Um, all in all, Pretty lackluster World Series, though. Um, the that's all I really gotta say. Yeah, I, I mean, at the end of the day, too, like the Rangers, 
the key thing that we kind of ripped them on entering in our MLB postseason preview was their pitching and their bullpen, and that actually proved to be one of their strengths throughout yeah. the entire playoffs, and especially the fact that they went on an absolute tear on the road where they did not lose a single game. I believe it was 11 straight wins on the road, which is a postseason record across all four major league sports. Yes, the NHL is still one of them. We will not go down that road once again. The MLS will not catch up to the NHL, knock on wood. Davey, your thoughts on the World Series and the MLB playoffs? Um, all right, let me let me just say this real quick. You don't don't throw shade on the MLS, all right? You know, Schwarz is coming to Miami. The MLS playoffs are heating up, all right? I'm just saying, you know, this David, is a, we this finally is a got Peter on a sport. podcast, and you're gonna put him to sleep five minutes, and we can't have that happen. But I get what you're saying. <laughs> look, look, look. I mean, we're not gonna touch him on the MLS. Nobody really watches it except for me. Um, oh, you know, yeah. I'm one of one of ten fans that watches. Look, either way, uh, be, uh, look, the MLB has a problem with marketing games, all right? Baseball is an American sport. In some ways, you could argue that it's almost more American than football. Borderline, right? When you think about spring, you think baseball. You know, when you think about, like, like kids' sports, like, the first thing that kids play is, like, peewee ball, right? The thing is that, like, those kids who play peewee ball aren't watching baseball anymore. Like, yes, they might be going to other sports, but the thing is, like, the baseball is a dying sport. They tried fixing it with the right, with the pitch clock, which I think in some ways has helped the game in many ways. I think we had a big discussion before the season whether it's going to help or hurt the game. I think personally it has helped the game. I think Absolutely. the issue is two small market teams. I understand. Fine. Like, you know, it might not be what MLB have wanted. Like, you know, it's not in the script, I guess you could say. But you have to do a better job marketing it. Like, Get better interns. Get do something. Like these NFL teams are getting millions and millions of followers on their inst- on their TikToks on their Instagrams because they bring in young, uh, yeah, like young talent to you know do their games like Theodore. You know that you know shout out to any team MLB teams that need you know a social uh, social media intern. Uh, they just need to do a better job marketing. Minnesota Twins rejected me to be their broadcast intern. You know. And I just don't get it. Like, they've spent their whole existence being terrorized by the Yankees. And they have their chance to hire a Yankees fan to come be a broadcast intern, and they reject it. All jokes aside, I knew it was a long shot of flying as a freshman, but, like, that one hurt. Like, we're not we're not Minnesota fans anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, mean, at the end of the day, though, you guys are absolutely right. I, Davian... You hit it on the head. I thought the pitch clock also did a great job this season, especially in the postseason. A lot of people were concerned with how that would change things, but I think I completely agree with you. I thought that that was a big role that it played, and I feel like viewership as a whole went up for the MLB. I think it was more watchable, but I think the big problem at the end of the day is I'm one of those kind of like middle fans. Like I was you see, I'm wearing a Cubs sweatshirt. I follow the Cubs periodically. I don't watch the Cubs during the regular season, but – if yeah. someone's like, hey, or, do you want to go to a Cubs game? I'll go to a Cubs game, absolutely. I love going to Wrigley. I love going to the Cubs games. I love going to White Sox games, too. No problem with going to White Sox games, either. They have a great steak sandwich. I have to just shout that out. It was so good, and I'm still not over how great that was. But anyways, going to baseball games, I think, is still a great experience, and I think a lot of people enjoy going to baseball games. Correct, but the yeah. problem is, it's just, when there's a million other things on TV, no one is really, unless you're a diehard baseball fan, no one's really intrigued to watch a three and a half hour baseball game. It's just not on, it's not the main thing for people to watch, especially the problem with the postseason is just it conflicts too much with the NFL and college football. And if you have the choice between, like, for example, this past weekend, if it was during the World Series, would you rather watch Alabama versus LSU or game four Diamondbacks versus Rangers? Obviously, you're going to watch Alabama versus LSU for and the average American. Rafi, to make matters worse, that's when the game seven was scheduled for. Like, it was going to air on Saturday night. Like, cause yeah. that, it just makes no sense to me personally what they're doing. And I get that there's a struggle, but there's got to be a better way to work around it. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's move on to our next topic. Let's get into some of the talk. We just mentioned Alabama, LSU. Theodore, you were on the sidelines. Well, not exactly on the sidelines, but you were on the ground for the entire Alabama LSU experience. I'll let you talk about it. I won't spoil what you did, but please entail us and the viewers on your experience with Alabama versus LSU. I'm sure you 
were going to bed very early at 6 o'clock p.m. You turned back your clocks for daylight savings, which is stupid, but that's for another day. And <laughs> I'm sure you were studying all day. So please tell us about your studying experience. Yeah, this so past my Saturday. studying began at 11 p.m. when I got back from announcing a hockey game. And I got to my friend's dorm and we took our signs and we walked our way over to the quad and we set up a blanket and we spent the next seven hours waiting online to get into college game day. Now, sadly, yeah. my hard hat, my Home Depot college game day hard hat is in the other room. I forgot it. I got gloves, receiver gloves that they gave me. But... um the point is, we got into college game day, and we um, were there, and we were front row because we were one of the first people in. Now, the sign that we held up, um, ear, earmuffs, Christian, um, I know you're listening to this, just don't listen to what we're about to say, but the sign said, Jane Daniels is a liberal. Um, it's not a political statement, but that's what the sign said. And there was a rule against bringing in political signs, but we, you know, snuck it in on there by, like, putting it behind another sign that said, the other sign said, Libby Dunn is the best thing to come out of LSU. And that one they let right in. And then, you know, we had the other one underneath it. So we get into college game day, and we are right behind Desmond Howard. Like, we are right behind where he sits. So anytime they cut to his camera shot, we're there with the sign. So we would hold it up, and just on the broadcast, you see the sign that just reads, like, Jaden Daniels is a liberal. And you could see, like, ESPN people back, like, behind where the show was set up, like, pointing at us and, like, shaking their heads. And, like, they were not happy. And they, I think, were trying to find a way to frame the shot without it because he kept seeing them move the shot. And then we just see, uh, like, you'd see the sign, like, be pushed in the frame because we'd, like, pass it along to get it in the – oh, my God. It was a fun – very fun. That was experience. the best part because you sent a picture to us saying that you were on TV and you showed the poster. And I remember watching the pics, too, and Des every time I went to Desmond Howard, there was someone, like, with their hand out, like, all the way stretched over, like, two people, like, getting the poster in the yeah, frame. Yeah, It was absolutely hilarious. Oh, yeah, talk God, a little yeah. bit, too, about what, what the game was like, what the atmosphere yeah. was like. Obviously, college game day is something that I wish to experience at some point in my life. But how was the game as well? Because Alabama certainly showed up. Yeah. Yeah, so college game day was awesome, obviously. Um, Pat – one more note on that before we get making Pat McAfee. Yeah, he is just so electric. He might be the greatest sports personality that, of our generation. Um, just everything about him. And in person, he's so much more excited. We were breaking into take it off chance, you know, trying to get him to take off his jacket and shirt, as those who watch game day have probably seen. And um, the producers of the show did not let him. Like, you could just tell that he was, like, trying to do it. It was, like, halfway off. You're going crazy. And then, like, some guy goes over to him and, like, makes him put it back. Anyway, that's besides the point. We get into the game, and it was a classic. First of all, Milra got so much hate, some of it coming from me. And I still don't think he's the best thrower. But he is such a good athlete, and he's being smarter. He's making better reads. The playbook is designed for him. Four rushing touchdowns is just insane, and Milro is playing out of this world right now. He's reminding me of Anthony Richardson in many ways. Yeah, but he low key does um, because he has the arm talent too. Now I don't know if he'll ever get to a point where he has the ability to throw like Richardson, but right. he really is. He has that kind of comparison to me. He I just love him so much right now. But he wasn't the best QB in the game. Jaden Daniels was, and Daniels did torch us. Um, and look, I'm really glad that he got out of this game. Now, Dallas Turner, he, it was not a dirty hit. It was not a dirty hit. I don't want to hear any of those allegations. It wasn't rough in the passer. Maybe. I don't, I don't know. I mean, it, in a way, it was rough in the passer. Like, yeah, he did use a little extra force. But to call it a dirty hit is just insane. It's a football play. Stuff happens. Um, and Alabama was the better team, and we won that game. As far as the atmosphere goes, Bryant Denny is a place that's like notoriously not very loud. Like Saban himself has like complained about it, where like fans just don't show up. And 
Well, fans show up, but they don't make a lot of noise sometimes. Yeah. That broke the stadium's decibel record right after that pick where, you know, we realized we were going to win the game. That place went crazy. And then they played Dixieland Delight. Check out the TikTok bench form underscore sports to see the Dixieland Delight from that game. It was really so fun. All in all, the greatest sporting event I've ever been to. And no, no, it wasn't better than Coach K's final game, which I was at in 2022. The second greatest sporting event I've ever been to. Best football game I've ever been to, and I just I had the time of my life there. It was just you so, know so. it's okay because I got to see Juwan Howard have a mental breakdown at Champaign for his game last year in double. Wait, were you so at, at the least... punch game? What were you at the punch game? Not no, that was just at SU, right? No, yeah, unfortunately, no. It was. Okay, I, was I still got to see Juwan Howard lose his mind though, so that was enough of <laughs> a great experience for me personally. I've I've had my fair share of games, although. It, at some point, I'm definitely going to have to make my way down to Tuscaloosa and watch an Alabama versus whoever game because that's going to be electric. I know this might not be fun to do, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into Alabama right now. Yeah. And they have just beaten LSU and Tennessee by two scores. And they were at a point where they beat Texas a and by one score. They beat Arkansas by one score. Obviously, we all remember USF. Theodore remembers that quite well, although it feels like that was five years ago at this point. Alabama right now reminds me of typical Alabama where they start off a little slow. They go under the radar. They suffer a loss early, and everyone's like, okay, Alabama. Like, they're gone. Yeah. Like, no. And just slowly they creep up on you and are slowly working their way back up in the rankings. Let's look at the last three weeks. At Kentucky – at home versus Chattanooga, and at Auburn. Auburn's not that good this year. Normally, it's a rivalry game, so there's still some a little bit of, like, this could be close for a little bit, but I don't think it's going to be close at the end. Yeah. Alabama currently sitting at an eight seed. I think after Georgia's win versus Mizzou, we're at a crash course between an Alabama-Georgia SEC championship game, and I think we really, we're really going to see the winner of that game go to the college football playoff, while the loser, I mean, Alabama goes to two losses. They're not getting it. And Georgia... Georgia, I'm concerned with. I mean, they beat Mizzou. It wasn't a pretty game, but they still wound up beating them at home. They still have Ole Miss next week at home. Now, Ole Miss just barely beat A&M, but A&M's not a bad team. They play then at Rock and Top of Tennessee. We all know my opinions on Tennessee this year. I don't think they're very good. And they close out in a rivalry game versus Georgia Tech at Georgia Tech. There's a chance that Georgia loses and slips up in one of these three games. Mm -hmm. And personally, too, a one-loss Georgia, even if they lose to Alabama in the SEC championship game, I don't necessarily think they get in by the logistics of if Oregon and Pac-12 and Oregon and Washington play each other in the Pac-12 and neither team has suffered any more losses. I mm -hmm. think the winner of that gets in. Michigan, Ohio State, the winner of yeah. that will get in. And then you start to – things start to look a little shaky for Georgia when you see that their best win right now is versus Kentucky, especially if they yeah. slip up at some point. But I want to hear your guys' thoughts on Georgia and Alabama right now because it feels like Alabama is just slowly getting closer and closer to the top four, and they're getting hot at the right time right now. Winner of the Bama Georgia game gets into the college football playoffs. I don't see, I I don't see FSU uh, really gaining the respect that they you know whatever deserved. I think like they slip up in the ACC, uh, really like the, the championship game, and because of their slip up, I see. Bama, uh, like the winner of the Bama Georgia game getting in. Uh, I don't, you know, I see the winner of the Michigan Ohio State getting in. Uh, and so, and then, yes, the, you know, you have the chance of, and then I do see like the winner of like Oregon, uh, Washington get in. That's my prediction. And let's not forget, Texas, they almost lost to Kansas State last, this past weekend. Mm -hmm. But Quinn Ewers has been out the last two weeks and he's going to yeah. be back soon. So you'd have to imagine that that's going to be a jolt for this Texas team as well. And, a Texas one loss, Big 12 conference champion. Yeah, that loss for Oklahoma is looking worse and worse as the weeks go on because Oklahoma has been falling a little bit. But hey, you got to be who you got to be. And Texas still, if anything, Alabama working their way up the rankings has been an even bigger benefit for Texas, who went to Tuscaloosa and beat them too. So Texas is a one loss, Big 12 champion. I think absolutely would get in over a one loss Georgia if they were to lose the SEC championship game. This, to me, is one of the most fun college football playoff races we've ever had. Because, first of all, the only guarantee, the only thing that I can guarantee you right now is that the 
Big Ten champ will be in, as long as it's a Big Ten East team, like unless Iowa pulls off the stunner, which they won't. Yeah. And that the SEC. Did you pop off that? Did you hop off that Iowa ride that you were on? For a I was trying to stir the pot. I was trying to stir the pot. Hey no guys, well, let's just talk about the Big Ten, right, real quick. Rocky, yeah. last week, right? I told you Rutgers might win that game. Just saying, they kept it close. They kept they it real close. Rutgers, Rutgers, exposed, no. Rutgers exposed one of my big critiques entering the college football season, which is on this podcast at some point. I don't have the time exactly, but if you look at our college football preview, I mentioned this. The one thing I'm concerned with with the Ohio State Buckeyes is their run defense, and we saw it on display. Blake Corum, Blake like Corum I said a couple weeks ago, my opinion has not changed. He is likely going to run for over 200 yards versus Ohio State in a couple of weeks. 100. Blake Corum. Blake Corum is still the best running back in college football. I've How is he not that. getting Heisman attention? Like seriously, I, 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 I think that just, game is going to put him on the map for potential. The thing is, out. last year he was getting a Heisman attention all year. You know, like he was a big story until getting hurt. And this year, it's like people have forgotten about him. Most people don't even think he's the best back in college football, which is absurd to me. Um. I think personally, and this is more, this is a destiny thing too. I think this is Michigan's year to go undefeated and win the Big Ten. Um, Did you see a sign that says that? Yeah. There were a lot of. Be careful though, they might take that. Especially when you consider the fact that this is their last year. Like we know that they will not be in this position next year. No. No, There's so many people. There's no way. Harbaugh will be gone. Half the team will transfer. And, um, They'll be they'll lose about ten scholarships a year, and that. Well, I don't know if Harbaugh will be gone, but you know. Harbaugh will be gone. He does not survive this. You don't think Harbaugh, he survives this investigation? The big thing too is JJ McCarthy Har- also yeah. is going to be going to the NFL draft. Blake Horam likely going to the NFL yeah. draft. So there's your two biggest players on offense. And even they the always ones have good defensive play. players that are going to be picked up too. The even like just the average starters, like why would you stay on that team? There's no reason to. The transfer portal is going to absolutely devastate Michigan. It's going to yeah, be and also like, Michigan's Michigan's schedule next year is so tough. Oh yeah, yeah, it no, is they are abysmal. It's like I think like every single game that they're playing next season is against a team that was at least once ranked yeah. this season. Michigan so, will not be in the top twenty-five to start next year. They might they might not even qualify for a bowl game. Not that they'll be eligible. Um, point aside, I really really like this team that they have this year. And I yeah. really do think that they will be the one seed going into the tournament or going into the playoff, rather. Um, my big point, though, on the college football playoff, Florida State, I think, is the most – they have the most clear path, Florida State and Texas, where if they win out, they're in. If they lose a game anywhere, they're out. Like a one-loss Florida State has no chance, right? We're all in agreement there. Absolutely, and they Agreed. likely are on a collision to play Louisville in the ACC championship. Which and, I'm, well, I'm, I'm not sorry. Louisville too. They They're under have, the radar. Like they, they don't have a shot. Team. If Notre yeah, Dame was probably. better, if Notre Dame was better, they'd have a chance. But Louisville. See, now you put me in a predicament where it's like, do I credit Louisville, but I give Notre Dame props, or do I dog on Louisville? Cause Notre, Notre Dame, Dame is a good team, Rafi. Stop slandering them. They're a good team. Yeah, good teams don't lose good. three games. Okay. My point, let's get to the big point that I'm trying to make yeah. here. These right. one-loss teams are going to be so hard to sort out. In yeah. my eyes, yeah. Georgia has no business being in the college football playoff if they lose a game. Oh, like if obviously if they lose in the SEC championship, if they lose to like Ole Miss next week, then whatever. Yeah, if they recover by beating Bama, then they're in. Let's talk about Ole Miss real quick. The Rebels have been great all year. Jackson Dart is one of the best QBs in the nation. Their only loss was a competitive game on the road at Bama, and that one loss is going to stop them from doing anything. Yeah. You know? This is why divisions are dumb because, you know, Ohio State's going to be in the same boat or Michigan. Whoever loses that game is going to be in the, in the same exact boat where they have no chance because of that one tough conference loss, you know? Yeah. Um, because one of those teams is going to get screwed over. You look at the um, – Even though Ohio State has been looking very good this season. You know, uh, yeah. 
beating Notre Dame, beating Penn State, I would say like they are very, they look better than Michigan on paper. Uh, I think, I think that I, I truthfully, I, just, I, I truthfully believe that Penn State. It, it, I think that game said more about Penn State and the gap between them and Ohio State and Michigan than it did about Ohio State being amazing. Because mm. although yeah. Ohio State played a good game, I personally didn't watch it, so I don't want to talk too much about the game because obviously I'm not going to talk about something I didn't watch. But just from what I was hearing, I think it was more about Ohio State, just about how Penn State is just – there's a there's a tier. Everything's in tiers yeah. at the end of the day. Right. You have Michigan and Ohio State. Now, obviously, I think we all, for the most part, agree that Michigan's better than Ohio State. We'll I think see what happens in a couple of weeks. But you can I put them on the same tier. They're on the same level. And then you have a, a fall-off, and then you get to Penn State. You have a yeah. bigger fall-off, then you get your Rutgers, your and Maryland, etc. And then you keep working your way down. Yeah, Iowa. But my point is that Ohio State-Penn State game, it was more telling about the gap between Ohio State and Michigan and Penn State than it was about how great of a team Ohio State is, in my personal opinion. But I also think it's important, because we talked about, we kind of hit on all the conferences. We talked a little bit about Texas and obviously their predicament. Texas Why is Washington not getting any respect? We need to put some more respect on Washington right now, because people, I get Oregon, they've been really good the past couple of weeks, but even ESPN's dumb college playoff thing, which obviously doesn't matter at the end of the day, because you play the games for a reason, they have Oregon at a higher chance of making the college football playoff than Washington. And Washington beat Oregon a couple weeks ago. Yes, it was a close game, but they still have that win. They've been in some tight matchups, but they're the better team right now. I uh, think Washington yeah, I more agree respect. That. Washington I think they're better than Florida State. You can make a good argument right now that their resume is better than Michigan and Georgia right now, whether you like it or not. I think Washington needs a little bit more respect, and Washington right now should be controlling their destiny more than Florida State, and they'll have the chance to prove it the next two weeks. They play Utah, and then they play yeah. at Oregon State. If they go into the Pac-12 championship undefeated, I think a one-loss Washington, if they lose to Oregon in the Pac-12 championship, I think that get, makes things very chaotic. But in, I think Washington can run the table the rest of the season. Yeah, I think they're not going. I think they're getting slept on personally. My thing is, you look at what Oregon did. The fact that they were a missed. 40 yard field goal away from upsetting Washington on the road. Like, Washington and Oregon to me are two of the best teams in the country. And I legitimately do think that if there's a one loss non conference champion that deserves to make the playoff, it should be Washington if they were to lose to Oregon in the Pac 12 championship. I agree. Absolutely. Because, look, let's, I'm going to say this. I, Florida State, if they lose a game anywhere, I don't want to hear the argument. I don't want to hear the argument for any ACC, eh, yeah, ACC team. Texas, if they're one loss, yeah, they deserve it. Um, they just, to me, and look, I've obviously looked at this mostly as a Bama perspective because I look at Bama and I know what we need to do to get in, which is win out. Um, man, I just honestly. I just love this whole debate. I think this would be an awesome year for a 12-team playoff. It would. I really do think there are a lot of That's teams. That's really need it. Yeah. And um, I'm just so excited for these next couple of weeks because, look, over the next few weeks, we are going to see a lot of teams get screwed over by the conference system. You know? Yeah. Yeah, but, you're really going to see it. It's going to suck. For like all but college football fans. We've got to enjoy it while it lasts. You know, we've got to enjoy the last three weeks we have plus or four plus with the conference championship games of these conferences because it I still really am sad about what's happening to the sport. Um, I think everyone is, right? Everyone is. And I think college football at the end of the day will be better because these changes that are made. I fully believe it, but I'm going to miss it. We all are going to miss it, so let's just, you know, we can have all these college football playoff debates, and we can enjoy these games, and uh, my advice to everyone is to just try and live in the moment and soak in all you can. That was very inspirational, Theodore. You know what else was inspirational today? CJ Stroud's performance, all right? Let's jump into the pros, yeah. all right? 
five touchdowns sure. over 400 yards breaking the season breaking a rookie quarterback record the guys the guys playing insane like he is him he is him i that. believe i believe the kids these days and you guys are you guys can correct me as you guys are the youngest the younger ones on the podcast i believe uh he is going uh he is playing some dope football absolutely amazing he is a dog as pat mackie would say i mean that that he's just playing great and he's been a perfect he's exactly what the texans need tank dell is also a great pick as well for the texans texans are four and four do i think they're going to make the playoffs i don't think so i think they're going to fall shorter they'll probably be in like the eight to nine seven to ten range but for a team that went out and traded their first round pick this year to the cardinals to get will anderson and trade up for him the Texans are doing – they play their cards really well if they keep this going. I got I to gotta give my props to them. I think yeah. they finally have a sense of direction, and that's something they've been missing the past couple of years. I 100% agree with that. And also, just – I mean, that game itself was just crazy. I mean, I, you know, nobody said it was going to be game of the week. Yeah, everyone thought, like, the, you know, the early morning game, uh, Chiefs-Dolphins uh, was game of the week. But this was a like borderline game of the week. Final score, 39-37. You know, score got me right there. Uh, and um, I cannot pronounce this guy's name, but the running back on the Texans, you know, kicked the, I guess, the game winning at the end of the day, uh, what should have been a game winning field goal. And then uh, CJ Shroud led the team down the field again. Uh, you know, and there was, uh, you know, it was sad to see some other games, you know, see like the way it came out. Uh, seeing the Vikings win, that was, that was impressive, you know, really throwing Josh Dobbs into that situation. But, you know, I, th- I give, I give, I give the Falcons more credit of losing that game than the Vikings of winning that game. Um, we saw the Patriots just do an abysmal performance against Commanders. Um, Theodore, you want to talk about your Giants team? Tommy DeVito is an ex-Syracuse quarterback. Like a guy yeah, who left Syracuse to go to Northwestern, a team that's like – Northwestern is literally Iowa without the good defense. Like that is what that program is. <laughs> and this be on that team last year. And on top of that, he's a rookie who's older than Stetson Bennett. And he's now the starting to be for the Giants. I mean... All because he's from Jersey. All because he's a local guy. Like, look, I love, like, supporting the local kids. But, like, this is literally a make-a-wish kid that we're rolling out as our quarterback. <laughs> well, look, you know, I think I think there's one answer. To the Giants' problems, actually two: Colin Kaepernick, uh, yeah, and Johnny Menzel. Yeah, they're the only two yeah. options out there. You know, I oh, mean, like, if we're gonna be serious. Do you though, think Tom so Brady will suit up for the Giants? Giants? Do you what think Tom Brady will come out of retirement to play for the Giants? Absolutely not. No, he's like coaching the Raiders' new. Uh, what is it? Uh, eight, like, what was this kid's name? Aiden uh, Aiden 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 he, he's like coaching yeah. Aiden McConnell. O'Connell, like he's like in the locker room and like. In McConnell, by the way. One touchdown, three picks coming into today in his career, falls out. Yeah. Um, I wonder why. I wonder why this guy played so good today. I mean, don't forget that this team was so much more motivated this week compared to last week with the firing of, with the cleaning of the house. I don't want any excuse. No. Look, first of all, Daniel Jones, I love you. I'm sorry for what you had to deal with. And I think we all we all knew this injury was coming. Because the line is new yet. Have y'all seen the Evan Neal highlights? Have y'all seen the compilations of him just standing there while the defender runs by him? Look, I'm sorry. First of all, how did Evan Neal not turn into a superstar? I'm sorry. This seemed like the most clear-cut draft pick of all time. Take an Alabama captain, an All-American who was great his whole career. Like, I just don't get how he turned into such a bad player. But, and he's not the only one. He's not the only problem on this line. The whole thing is just so broken. I love the job that Joe Shane had done with most of the team, but the line has just been atrocious. He deserves some blame there. Um, okay, I've already ripped on uh, DeVito enough. I'm not going to bring him in for any more. Prayers up for Daniel Jones. Um, I just, man, Brian Dable is in for a rough conversation this offseason because. I just, I don't know if he's going to survive this, you know? I don't think he's on the hot seat yet. Okay, well, look, 
I'm saying he's on the hot seat the same way that I'm saying Bill Belichick's not on the hot seat. So if you, we think yeah. that Dable's on the hot seat, then Bill Belichick must be in the hot now, seat. Here's like, the thing with Dable. If you had told Giants ownership that this is how Dable's second season was going to go when they hired him, like no one would have a problem with it. Like We kind of expected that this is what the Giants were in for. But the fact that we were so good year one and now look at where this team goes to. It's the same thing that happened with Joe Judge, you know, and with um, Ben McAdoo. Giants coaches have a track record of peaking year one, and I just don't know why. You know, because with Joe Judge, you look at all, like, the stuff he did, all the funky, like, tack practice stuff and all that. It all looked awesome because we were decent year one. Like, when you're winning, certain stuff works. And all of Dable's stuff, it absolutely works when you're a winning football team. And that's why he had so much success as a coordinator, because he really was that good. And when you're able to be in a program that keeps winning, and he was a part of that. He was part of the reason they won. It all works out. But now, just I got to imagine he's close to losing the locker room. I got to imagine that the players are turning on him. Uh, And I just... And it's just going to be such a, tough, such a tough decision. This Giants team right now looks like we're light years away from competing. Yeah, I yeah. hate to be like the doomsday guy, but like we basically have a way out of Daniel Jones' contract at the end of next year because of the way it was structured. Like we can get out and not pay a lot of dead cap. And I honestly fully expect the team to do that at this point, you know? I think there's so many good teams in the draft right now that you could do that. Yeah. Like, the Giants Taylor, are going to be not Penix, you know, everyone. Just really good yeah, talent out there. This just sucks. We'll I'm just it'll there. be, I'm it'll so be interesting to see next year when Arthur Smith and Brian Dable suit up for their coaching can, gigs with the Shanghai Sharks because yeah. at this point... I'm can we talk about the fact, them. Ralphie, can we talk about the fact that they, the Falcons had their backup tight end throw a pass to their third th- third string tight end while Kyle Pitts, the highest drafted tight end in the history of the league, blocked for the two of them. And they did this in the red zone. <laughs> See, honestly, I've, I've not, I haven't been watching Falcons games. I've decided to be more to just do homework instead. I'd rather do chemical engineering homework for four hours than watch the Atlanta Falcons play. That's just how done I am with the Atlanta Falcons. But we can discuss more about how the Falcons are terrible and how they keep losing in hilarious manner on next week and in future podcasts because we're running a little long. But then again, we had great conversations, so that's always a good thing at the end of the day. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Bench Warmers Sports Podcast. Tune into next week. We'll talk a little bit more about the NFL. We'll talk a little NHL. T. Higgins got his revenge. Yes, we haven't talked a little. We haven't talked at all about the NBA, so we should probably talk a little bit about that. Aside from James Harden, when will he miraculously gain 50 pounds and request out of LA? We'll see what happens. Maybe it'll be next month. Maybe it'll be tomorrow. We'll tune in to our well, next podcast. Strip and clubs that out. in LA are much better than the ones in Philly. I think he stays for a bit longer. Huh. Eh, probably, maybe like two weeks. We'll give him. But yeah. that'll do it for this edition. We hope you enjoyed. Have a great rest of your day. Go Tigers. Peace. Roll Tide.